Hey, this is Russell and I work at the video store, the place you can go once a week whenever it is movie night. Interesting people pop in to rent something each week and when the store is quiet, I get to watch movies and series and talk about them with some of my best friends. All right, let's do it. Let's open up the shop. How's it? Good morning. It's GeForce. Yee. GeForce was a little sick. I've been a, I've been a little under the weather. <laughs> you got the Covies. Yeah, I think so. You had it. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, who knows how long these things last. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully I don't get it now. Yeah. <laughs> um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the video store. Um, today on the show, we have Gareth Cliff. Yeah. Which is very interesting and exciting. Right. I have been... Over the course of our year so far doing the video store, I've very much been roping in my friends mm. and the people around me or the people who I've come to know. Um, and then as we've been doing it, I've been building this wish list yes. of some of the personalities that exist in South Africa. And and we have been working together um, with the lovely Rochelle Krauss, who is helping us book a lot of this talent. Okay. Um, she is our publicist. Cool. Um, shout out to Rochelle. And um, I've, we've had this wish list. Mm. And Gareth Cliff was on that. Yeah. And um, so it was great that they could make time for us. Yeah, definitely. We we typically have the guest pop in to mm. rent something and they come to the bioscope. Yes. Uh, in this case, I visited him. Yes. At Cliff Central. So uh, things sound a little different because we're actually using their microphones. I came with... Um, uh, our little setup. Our setup, and then cool. they were like, "Everything's we're, we're set sorted. Up. We, nice. we should just do this." It sounds really good. They have well, a very he's, legit setup. <laughs> he's, he's a professional dude. Yeah. Um, so that is going to happen in a moment. Um, I'll I'll be visiting yes. Gareth. But uh, one thing we wanted to just mention: um, there is a, a film called The Nun Two mm. coming out. There was obviously The Nun, and yes. now this is The Nun 2. One of James Wan's many horror franchises. Yeah. I I, I tend to I tend to skip horror. Yes. <laughs> um, my life, I feel, is exciting enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've just never quite um, never quite been a horror dude. Right. Have you? Um, kind of. It depends on the kind of horror. Yeah. Because there's a bunch of different kinds of horror. But, uh, yeah, it's all very highly anticipated. Mm. The Nun 2. And uh, as the video store, there is a special screening. So if you're listening to this in the week in which this episode's coming out, on the 7th of September in both Joburg and Cape Town, there is a special pre-release screening cool. that we, as the video store, tend to go to. Yes. But this one's a little extra special. They're giving us some tickets to give away. Nice. So uh, when this episode comes out, we are going to post about it on Instagram, on our Instagram page. Uh, page which is the video store pod yeah. and over on facebook we've got a group uh, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the video store cool. and on those posts uh, we would like you to leave a comment telling mm. us why you should come yeah to the special screening and we've got some tickets to give away nice there'll be links in the description to all our social medias so yes you don't have to remember them but we want to get to know you yeah I exactly. think that'll be nice to to meet some guys mm. Who who want to come to these kinds of screenings? And um, if you, especially if you listen to the podcast, we'd love to yeah. hang out with you on the night. Mm. And there's always some free popcorn, <laughs> <laughs> which is courtesy of the distributor. In this case, it's Empire Entertainment, okay, cool. who are really lovely folks. Yeah, and so it's cool that they've given this um, prize away. Cool. All right, but I think mm. let's not waste too much time. No. Um, we're going to get into this. But please stick around afterwards. I'm going to catch up with Graham. There's a bunch of stuff we've been watching. Yeah. And we'd love you to stick around for that post-guest chat. Cool. And yeah, let's get into it. Let's do it. All right. This is Gareth Cliff popping in to rent something. How's it? Great. Um, this is very, very cool. And I like what you've done with the bioscope. Independent <laughs> bioscopes are very cool. I, I, I can't believe I've been there and I've been there on a Sunday and I went yes. to see 
a, a, a tremendous presentation, Luca and, and Yashin, um, about the universe. Amazing, right? Phenomenal. And when I try and explain to people what we do at the Bioscope, I love to use that as an example because it's yeah. sometimes it's not even cinema. <laughs> he, well, he, I mean, hasn't cinema also changed? I just had a conversation literally an hour before you arrived about whether or not it's worth going to see Oppenheimer. Okay. And I came to the conclusion that it's three hours I'll wait till it's. Uh, I can watch it on my laptop. Well, let me tell you, it's totally <laughs> worth watching in IMAX. I'm sure, um, With the, especially because you've got a nuclear explosion. Yeah, the sound. You forget that a big part of IMAX. You think going in that it's all about the screen. It's all about the visuals. But mm. what's underrated about the cinema experience is the sound, and it's incredible. And it three hours goes by quite easily. Okay. That that part's not too All too right. tough, yeah. Um, no, and you've got to make it an experience. Okay, and well, I, I think I, I feel chastised. Well, <laughs> I won't bring it up again. No, no, no. It's exciting <laughs> to to talk about, and I think it's cool that recently, you know, cinemas won. Yeah. Cinema has gotten people coming out for Oppenheimer, and people are dressing up in pink and going to watch Barbie. It's right. cool that that just the act of getting together in a group yeah. is no, is, no. The, this is has winning. been this has been a good. Month for cinema. Totally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Universe on Stage was something that I take great joy in having kind of born out of the bioscope. Luca uh, came in on a random day and just said, oh, yeah, and I've been thinking about this show. And I was like, dude, sounds great. You know, he's this um, – he, he, he's a, um actuarial scientist, but he's got this love and passion for – black holes and, and space. And I was mm. like, anyone who talks like that saying, I want to do that, I want to grow that kind of community or uh, whenever they talk about that and they want to use the bioscope, it's always like, geez, you've got to, it's got to be here. Absolutely. And so we've developed this That's show very cool. and it was very cool that you came out. So no, I, it, was, I, it was good fun. Um, I, I always think that it's nice to, to learn new things and nice to go into new environments. But as I get older, I'm becoming more and more difficult and, and less likely to be persuaded and to stuff like that. So when I do, once I'm there, I love it. Yeah. But actually getting me to leave the house is bloody awful. <laughs> the bioscope is, is also certainly very much a thinking person's space. That's also how I've always described it to people over right. the years. It's people that want to learn more. They want to come to the documentaries that are about like a, an important topic. Right. Um, so yeah, we're taking great joy in that. And then of course the video store has now been a new baby for us to talk yeah, more about that's so cinema. Cool. I, remember, I remember video stores when I was a kid. <laughs> it was a thing. So perhaps speaking on that, um, it's quite nice for us to to go back and, and perhaps go through a little journey. Cool. And and see the films that were big for you along the way. So curious to know, where did you grow up? So I grew up in um, – I, I was born in Pretoria – Lived for the first few years on a farm near the Hardy-Bearsport Dam. Then we moved to um, KZN for a little while. I was at primary school there. Moved back here for high school. And pretty much Pretoria. And then, you know, my first uh, home outside of my parents' home was in Morningside in Santon. Uh, spent a couple of years at, 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 at an apartment. And then um, moved back towards the Pretoria side. So over the Borevors curtain again. <laughs> it's got a it's got a, a different energy to Joburg. Pretoria, more, yeah, it's much more relaxed. I always say um, two degrees warmer, ten rand cheaper, <laughs> and people are nicer. Yeah, you know? they're not as stressed as do you know. Joburg's a bloody hard place to live in. We're we're used to it because we we we've lived here. Yeah, and we forget that the amount of tension and stress and energy in the air in Johannesburg because it's also it's one of the few cities in the world that isn't built on a river or a port that's what I always say to people and because we are a city that was founded on gold yeah it's a place of huge materialism and crass ugly kind of real world yeah no and if concerns. it doesn't if it doesn't work go over the hill and do it again correct and people here don't really have time you know also they they they, they mean what they say yeah. They don't really have time for nonsense. They're not going to, like, Cape Tonians will say to you, oh, we must definitely do something and nothing ever happens. Yeah. Joburg people actually get <laughs> things done. But Pretoria has all that because a lot of the people who work in Johannesburg live in Pretoria. Yeah. That's why the highway is such a nightmare. Yeah. But it has a 
it it has a, a gentility which Johannesburg sometimes lacks. You know, yeah. people in Pretoria don't go, "Ah, how's it, bro? You're hot, eh?" <laughs> Talk like that. It's a funny thing. Um, so, growing up, we've got uh, we've got a, a category of film that we call the the puppy love film, mm. which is your 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 first partner, your first love. Oh, okay. So, yeah, and this would be the one that you take your girlfriend so in standard two. This is like, yeah, maybe see. you right. can hold hands or Oy. you know, and and curious to know for wow. you growing up, what was that? You know, there's an innocence to the puppy love film. Um, curious I've, to know what, what that I, I was. I've got to tell you, you, I've always really hated <laughs> romantic movies. Okay. I've always hated them. I've never found them particularly compelling. Uh, I've always preferred to laugh. And maybe because when I was at school, um, the girls weren't interested in certainly any of the things that I could do except make them laugh at that point. Okay. So making them laugh was a way for me to get them. Okay. And for me to get their interest. But this So so if I could if I could do that in a movie as well, the movie experience would be expanding on on what I was already successful in territory wise. Okay. So it would be funny stuff. It wouldn't be serious. But stuff. more more just as a as a metaphor, an analogy for, for the kind of film that, that came your way I'm at trying that to point. Think what your kind your of, relationship with cinema. Yeah, so what sort of um what sort of movies were around when because I think you're about the same age as I am. Maybe you're a bit younger. I was born in 85. Okay, no, you're a lot younger. <laughs> um, I, I sometimes feel older, but yeah. I don't know. Uh, okay, well, if there wasn't an obvious one that, that stuck out, maybe it'll come to you a little bit later. But the one that you yeah, I think watched, if, if you watched get a lot other, of other movies. Okay, okay the, my favorite movie of all time, and I did see it at the cinema, was Remains of the Day. Remains with of Anthony the Day. Hopkins and Emma Thompson. Okay. He plays a butler. Okay. In a house, a country house in England, just after World War I and before World War II. Okay. And it's the story of unrequited love between the two of them. She's okay. the housekeeper, he's the butler. But it's 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 just never it never happens. Okay. It's the most absolutely frustrating movie you've ever seen, but it's also Beautiful. It's put together beautifully. Okay. Um, so that, every, that every, one stuck out for you. Every scene is just laden with kind of symbolism and 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 this 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 hanging, desperate kind of please just just be with each other situation, and it just never it never happens. No, oh, interesting. Okay, how old were no. you when you watched that? Oh no, that must have been when I was in my early twenties or late uh, teens. Okay, okay, but you consider that your your, it's my favorite your movie favorite of all movie. time. Okay, yeah, it's, because it's because we've got made. the we've got the puppy love film, and then after that we've got your your kind of high school crush, like the film that the film that that for you. Yeah, chronologically. So again, you know, I was I was a Star Wars fan. I I liked Indiana Jones. I liked. What did you think of the new one? Have you watched? It? I haven't. I won't watch the new one. I refuse to. <laughs> no, I refuse to watch. I didn't watch the. Uh, crystal skull one either okay because you want to keep your heroes your heroes yeah <laughs> and, and I, I hate what star wars did with with luke skywalker in in the final three that they've just massacred and okay and, uh, in yeah. an abomination of cinema turned into just absolute fodder for people who couldn't care less about the star wars story i think george lucas must quietly be crying in some corner of his house right now thinking about I wife, sold wife his is, soul to wife his tears with all his money well he may be <laughs> but I, I think i think deep down inside he knows he's made a terrible mistake okay all right so, so, so i'm hurt about that okay if you were looking for pain you found it <laughs> all right um interesting but uh, puppy love i can't help you um high school crush i mean there were a lot of those sort of um those teen movies when we were kids, I suppose, that, yeah. I, that I also really liked. I mean, uh, things like Ferris Bueller's Day Off, yeah, classic and shit like that. That was yeah, that was really cool. Yeah, and I remember I watched that at the cinema. I must have been in primary school. Yeah, yeah, and and I I, I loved that story because it was just you know this kind of teenage rebellion, guy meets girl, love story comedy it was all the right things yeah we we've had an event at the bicycle called we're bunking yeah and and we we do it on a midday on a friday and the That's idea awesome. is like 
get off work, come and watch a movie. I mean, the Please first do, movie- not, do not go around persuading South Africans to take any more time off work than they already do. <laughs> We've got an economy to keep going here. No, and – you can build my economy by coming to the bioscope. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've got that high school crush, and then we we like to then ask people, um, as you leave school, you get a little bit more serious. Life gets a bit more serious. You mm. settle down with someone. Mm. Like, what's the film you kind of settle down with? And I think at that point, you're kind of crafting probably your career. You've probably come out of high school at this point. Where did you study? Well, um, I studied at Tux in Pretoria. Did you do like media stuff? Uh, no, I studied law, oh, which I, I hated. Um, and eventually halfway through final year, I quit. I didn't want to do law anymore. And my, you, were, my, you were so close. Yeah, I know. My parents keep telling me that. And, and they said, look, we're not paying for any of this. And I said, fine. And then I went and got a job in radio, yeah. which they're still not sure if it's a career <laughs> or not. And that's some 25 years later. Um, obviously, five was the big radio time what was what well I, I started that? off at 702 um okay. and i i did afternoons there for a bit then i did mornings i took over from john burks and before john robbie um and then 5fm made me an offer it was it was a bit of a there was an there was an undercover deal going on because while i was still doing the morning show at 702 my now business partner then manager Rena Brumberg and uh, Peter Matlare, who'd just taken over at the SABC, had got into conversation about bringing me across to five. Mm. And I started there in the early 2000s, and they put me on afternoons to begin with, and then later on onto mornings. Yeah, mornings mm. was a big... Yeah, we did that show for eight years. Yeah. Mm. Um, mornings was happening at the same time as Idols. Uh, Idols had started before I'd started 5FM. So okay. it was while I was still at 702, but they were more or less concurrent. And I could do both because Idols, everybody imagined that it would take, you know, hours and hours of every day of the week. And really the shooting schedule was very easy for the judges. And we would just arrive and then yeah. we'd do our thing and then we'd leave. Yeah. We didn't have to be there for rehearsals or any of that stuff because we weren't, we weren't rehearsing lines. Yeah. So we would just walk in usually in wardrobe because they wouldn't tell us what to wear. Yeah. And then we'd go into, into makeup. The director would come in while we were sitting there and say, hey, I need you to do this and this and this. We'd go, cool. Mostly we'd forget what he asked us to do. <laughs> and then we'd go on the show live. And, and the morning show on, on Five was, was really, I think we broke all the records. I mean, in commercial radio terms, we had an enormous audience. We were pulling in millions and millions of rounds in advertising and we'd created sort of a whole bunch of catchphrases and ideas and things that people were participating in it it felt like a national project in some way yeah and i think it you know at very least uh, i'll be proud if people found it worth laughing at in the mornings which yeah. is good enough but i think it was a little bit more um to not put too fine a point on it, I, I do believe we, we kind of became one of those things that brought people together. And increasingly in South Africa at the moment, I feel like that's missing. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. And it, it, I've certainly felt at least, yeah, with Short Straw, with the bias code, with everything mm. I do, you, you get the feeling now that everyone is just in their own little bubbles. And I think you kind of saw that coming, right? Um, I think – from five to well, I realized like Cliff Central? you know, morning show on on a big commercial station. It's only a matter of time before they find a reason because you've become too expensive. You know, they they're paying you more every year, or because they need to change. Because for some for some obscure, bizarre reason, every time management have a working wheel, they want to reinvent it. Yeah. Um, in all radio stations all over the world all the time. And in the words of Jake White, don't change a winning formula. <laughs> Correct. And they, they, they would have wanted to. And I remember they were talking in the beginning of 2014. And we well, were thinking about doing this and that. And I, I went off to New York. Um, ironically, 2013, Nelson Mandela died. And in 2014, we put on a tribute for him in New York, which was um, at a, a big cathedral I was on stage with Morgan Freeman reading passages from Long Walk to Freedom. Oh, wild. The Soweto Gospel Choir sang at the end of it. Bill Clinton gave the keynote address at this this tribute. Yeah. And I had said to 5FM, 
before we went and did it in the January of 2014, don't you think this is something you should pay for, you should be involved in? We can get sponsors, we could do a whole thing in New York. No, it's not really our target market. I thought, what, Nelson Mandela is not your target market? <laughs> so I, I had, you know, Rena and I discussed many times, when is the right time to leave? And we okay. were like, these people don't know what they're doing. They're, they've got their heads up their asses. And we need to start looking to the future. Yeah. And that was where, obviously, online was going to be the future, digital streaming, podcasting. Yeah. And the idea for Cliff Central had been bubbling around for a while. And we decided to press the button once we got back from New York, but we didn't tell them until a week before I resigned. Oh, okay. So we didn't tell them anything. And the, the, the week before I resigned, we kind of just said, oh, no, the contract that you've waited for us to sign, we're, we're just the lawyers are busy with it. And we delayed and delayed. And then on the last day I resigned on air, they had no idea. Caught them completely off guard with their pants down. And that's why for about a month or two afterwards, they were scrambling to put together some kind of morning show. Okay. They threw in whoever they could find. It started off with poor old Grant, and then they, they, they eventually talked fresh into doing it. And against his will, he wasn't keen to do it at all. And, you know, it was a, it was a bit of a coup de grace for us because we could start what we were doing. And we had a month between when I did my last show and, 5FM at the end of March and we launched Cliff Central on the 1st of May we had a month to play you know this game of where's Gareth what's next and people really cared because mm. we built such a loyal and enormous audience so it was a fun fun thing to do that and and I don't regret any of it okay. it was the right time to go just doing um quit while you're at the top you know not, yeah. while, not while you're starting to slide down perhaps you've um explained this at ad nauseum but you use the term unradio. Mm. W- w- sorry, do you mind explaining to me what that well, what that term was? It, it seemed at the time that there was a lot of countercultural stuff going on. Um, I don't. I didn't think uh, we came up with unradio. I think it was actually um, some friends of ours at an ad agency at, at uh, TBWA who were playing with the idea. They said they'd do it for us, as you know, yeah, part of the kind of fact that we'd worked together and been friends for a long time. Um, Rena knows John and, and Reg, who started the agency. And I had got to know a whole lot of the people who'd come through after that. So they did this as a campaign. It was almost like a, a political party manifesto, but it wasn't a political party. Mm. Okay. So I wrote this manifesto. They took that. They came up with the term unradio. What was we the, thought, what was, that's cool. What was the, the chief argument of the manifesto? What was the so sort was, of chief it point? It was that South Africa needs something new. Um, radio is not going to last forever. Yeah. Um, the entertainment business is, is you know, needs needs something that's revolutionary. People need to be able to speak honestly and openly again. Um, social media has stolen some of that thunder, but it's still not authentic communication because it's not yeah. face to face and it's not, you know, mouth to ear and all of those kinds of things. But on radio, the idea there was that we were going to do things differently. Because Five FM, especially, same as. Metro are inside the SABC building. Yes, yeah. And so I found it interesting that you're under that umbrella. And with that also comes a certain level of code of conduct, like all radio stations. So, but, yeah, but I the, never it, really bothered about the, that. There, there seemed to you, be you an know extra. I never paid any attention to the rules. <laughs> sure. But, I mean, it's interesting that those were still there. And I know um, some of the guys in the history of Five that also got in trouble for calling out African leaders or something. And there was, well, I there remember was that one of the things, ironically, um, the EFF had launched that year. Oh, and wild. the elections were that year. So it was mm. a very fractious time. And I wanted to interview Julius Malema because he was the founder of this new political party. He and I had had conversations before. They wouldn't let me talk to him. They wouldn't let me have him on the show. Interesting. That yeah. was the only time that management ever really put their foot down and said no. And I think there was pressure from the ANC at that point. But I could also see it was just before old Claudi Mutsuaneng took over, mm. who was an, he was a clusterfuck of a human being. Yeah. And incompetent, ham-fisted, and unbelievably stupid in everything that he did. And the, the, That I was thought, the head of the SABC. Yeah, he took yeah. over. And, and it was shortly after I left. But they called me in 
on, on that final day and their, their desperation, they kind of called me to a floor I'd never been to, so high up it was that my ears popped in the <laughs> lift on the way up. And I walked into this, um, this huge plush office with sofas all over the place, a private little bathroom. He was the head of commercial radio, some guy I'd never met before, supposedly my boss's boss's boss or something. Okay. And he said, what do you need? What can we give you? And it felt so good because I looked him in the eye and I said, there's nothing you have that I want. Okay. And there was nothing he could say to that. So I walked out there feeling as if my balls were as big as <laughs> billiard balls. <you laughs> okay. Know, rugby balls. Yeah. Fucking melons. Okay. And I never looked back. That was yeah. the last time I ever was at the SABC. Okay. It was, a, it was, it was cheeky. Yeah, but I, but I, <laughs> I kind of, I kind of had to believe that what we were going to do next was going to be more exciting, and it, it has been. Yeah, my yeah, and it's interesting the the loss of this kind of mainstream media, um, where we're all tuning in. Hmm. I think I've I've long since said these kinds of things, whether they're right or wrong. But you know, I always think of someone like like a Beyonce is perhaps one of the last big artists of mainstream media and like Game of Thrones is one of the last yeah. big shows where we it's, all it's tuned where, where in. It becomes an event rather than just a service. Well, just a, a conversation that we're all in. Now yeah. the audience might be as big, but you're either in it and you know it and love it or you've never heard. Yeah, <laughs> right. And my heart goes out to a, an artist trying to make it today. Oh because man, musicians. When At least radio gave you a place where once you would got onto radio, you had a fair degree of confidence that you'd be successful. Well, there was just you this gigs, massive… You could, you could sell music. Your bubble just could oh. grow in one, in one big burst. Yeah, now you have to bigger. compete with everyone else on YouTube. Yeah, and you just got to grow your, your, your bubble sort of inch by inch. Um, you you had us on um, short straw came to Cliff Central once, mm. and I um, I must say out of all the interviews we did or have ever done over the years, um, I, I actually thought that you were one of the few who kind of got it, <laughs> who kind of got what the life of a musician is, where it's not where I think you understood. I can't remember how you phrased it, but I just remember in that moment going, okay, no, he gets it. Well, no, thank you. I, you know, every time I, I bring anyone in for an interview, I really try to learn something from them because everyone can teach you something. Yeah, because the, the, the behind the curtain is the fact that it's not necessarily that glamorous. Oh, no, that you've got to work real but hard. People think that about you... everything. They, they think Tom Cruise's life is all the red carpets and the, you know, the, the, the being on posters and looking cool and doing stunts and all that. The real work is like imagine learning lines in a caravan. Yeah. Don't tell me that's glamorous. Yeah. And th that's what he's probably spending most of his time doing. Yeah. Or just going, reading through absolute drivel in scripts. Yeah. Um, or having to sit in meetings with producers who are just horrible people mm. who he has to get the money from to produce the next movie. No one thinks of those things. Yeah. They think he's a movie star. How bad could his life be when he isn't? Filming a stunt, he must be lying on the beach, yeah. sipping a cocktail. Yeah. No, and I just remember just feeling like you got it. And I thought, okay, no, this is cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, look, it. I, I've always had a lot of um, simpatico with musicians because I feel there's there very few things in the world I'm jealous about. Okay. One of the things that I envy is the ability to write a song. Not yeah. to perform a song or sing a song or play a song. It's the Write writing. a song. And okay. I have enormous respect and maybe it just comes from envy but i have enormous respect for musicians for that reason because they can do something i cannot do and okay. whenever i meet someone who can do something i cannot do it it intrigues me have you tried much oh, please I, I, what on what I, I can play the piano moderately well but okay. i i can't compose a melody well the one thing i can it's say it's hard to do sure but the one thing i can say is that it is in many ways a muscle and uh, we felt that with one album with Short Straw in particular, where we gave ourselves this ridiculous task of um, putting out one song a month Oof, for a year. Oh, dead <laughs> Oh, man. And, um, and we thought, no, we got it. We're like six songs in. It'll be cool. We'll keep writing, keep <laughs> crafting. But of course, when we had these songs banked, there were a few where we were like, no, we want to do that later. We only want to do that last. And so we found ourselves within a few months going, shit, we got to write, record 
a song out a month. But we were writing a lot, putting a lot out, and I remember feeling this is a muscle. <laughs> We've been working at it now for so long that we're writing some of the best stuff we we thought we'd ever. But written. It's, it, they say that about writers too. So I've I've written two books, and I hated the experience of both <laughs> because there were deadlines. Okay, and suddenly you feel like you're being strong armed into telling stories. And I also thought like the one especially, which was autobiographical. Like who wants to hear? the biography of at that stage someone in their th- late 30s yeah it's not i haven't lived enough to be able to you know that's like so why did you write it to, because the publisher said we've got to the first book was successful we got to do another one what, what led to the first one uh they they came to a meeting and said to me how about a book and before i'd even considered it really everyone else had said yes and <laughs> suddenly i was writing a book and it was short little anecdotes kind of stories from my own life ob- observations funny things it was an easy book to write it was a fun book to write the second one was absolute hell but i'm pleased with what came out at yeah. the end it was it was useful it was also at a point where i was ready to tell some stories okay. i divided into four so the first chapter was you know the the beginning of my own life and kind of some some early observations and things there the second part was radio the third part was television, and the fourth part was starting Cliff Central. So mm. I had I had a story to tell, but you it didn't. Some structure. I tried to make it less about me and more about kind of radio in South Africa, television, the experience of television, and then starting a business. Mm. I don't know. It, it, they yeah. both did well. I'm very happy they did. But authors say, to your point, that they have to just keep writing. Yeah. Even if it's rubbish, mm. every day you have to write two, three, four pages, however much you can get out. And maybe that's true for music as well. But to be able to compose a beautiful melody, yeah, I mean, that's just, that's no, sure. godly. And it's, it's very that's special godly. where some of these moments happen where you've crafted 80% of the song in 30 minutes, 40 oh, minutes. You, you'd appreciate this. On, on a whim, I started chatting to someone that was at this event for the Bioscope many years ago. Um, um, older gentleman, uh, English guy, He'd come out because he was the manager of a young Nigerian artist and there was this conference that was happening. Oh, so what have you done? How? We somehow got into this chat and within about 10, 15 minutes, I realized this guy has had this incredible career. One of which was being in this band called Sailor. I don't know whether you remember the band Sailor. Mm. He, he said, oh, you probably don't know us, but our biggest claim to fame is we, were, we had a number one that took Bohemian Rhapsody off its record you're um, joking. It's record um, number one You're joking. position. Um, and so that checked out. And then he said he was also part of um, Culture Club. He was like part of a band, extra band member. And him and Boy George. And did Boy George's Culture Club. Yeah. Him and Boy George were messing around at a piano. And he said they wrote Karma Chameleon oh, together. It said it took, Good heavens. He said it took them about 30 minutes. They wrote it in 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and it was just interesting listening to this guy talk and, and just, you know, someone who's got stories about McCartney and Damn. all these other people. I just so loved that's it. That's amazing. But, but I just loved hearing this, this story that Karma Chameleon was written in 30 minutes. Because that and makes you sense. I kind of believe it, though. It sounds it like then, the kind of song that was written in 30 minutes. <laughs> it's a good song, but, don't get me wrong. But it doesn't sound like something that they poured over like Leonard Cohen did over Hallelujah for perhaps, years and years and years. Perhaps yeah. not, Yeah. But um, okay, so we've we've established what your favorite film is. Would mm. you think that's your forever film? Do you think you'd you, you could watch I hope that not, forever? Not because it's depressing as hell. <laughs> but it it is one of my favorite movies. Yeah. Um, okay, so that was in your twenties. Mm-hmm. Okay. Curious to know what was the film that you were perhaps a bit too young to see that when you saw it. it <laughs> oh, it's Sharon Stone and Basic Instinct, but I don't think I was too young. It was just, I think that the was, world was too young. That was, that you know, was this, okay. pre, this predates Janet Jackson's tit flopping out at the Super Bowl and all of that stuff. And, you know, yeah. we didn't have the internet sure. at, at that stage. So that was the most raunchy thing available. But perhaps, Sharon, Sharon Stone flashing her beaver to the whole world was like, Jesus, it was a daring this is move. exciting. Um, this is very exciting. I don't think anyone <laughs> wasn't talking about that. You talk about events. Sure. 
Oh, you say Sharon Stone now, that's still any, <laughs> all anyone thinks about. <laughs> um, perhaps on a, a sort of horror level, was there any film that, that came out? That- no, I've, never, I've always detested horror movies because I used to be very frightened as a kid walking around the house at night and all that stuff. I mean, I Especially if you were that. in a farm. Yeah, that scary? you're right, exactly. And you hear noises on the window and you think – Oh, no. Yeah. I remember I was traumatized uh, by an episode of The Twilight Zone okay. where there was this creature on the wing of the plane. Did you ever see that? No, didn't you should, see that you, one, yeah. You should do a Twilight Zone thing at the Bioscope. Yeah. That would be a massive one. Yeah. Because um, this thing, I don't know how old I was, but I remember in the scene, there's this guy sitting at the window on a plane and there's a huge storm outside the plane there's lightning and th- he sees in a flash of lightning this thing with like wings and spines coming out of its neck on the wing of the plane Hector. but at a distance yeah and he kind of looks again and rubs his eyes and the, the rain is coming up against the window and there's lightning and then he sees nothing and he turns around and he calls the stewardess and he's like I think I just saw something at the window and she's on her way but she's making her way slowly down the aisle and and he looks again, and it's right at the window. Jesus. But it's tearing the engine apart and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> it just it screwed you up. Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How I young were like, you at that point? I can't remember. Okay, yeah. I can't remember. But scenes like that, if yeah. you – maybe <laughs> maybe it was we'll just the idea track of, it down. oh, no, you know, air travel's not such a good <laughs> idea anymore. I'm not sure what it was, but that really screwed me up for a little while. Okay. Uh, what, are you, what are you enjoying now? What, what kind of – Movie-wise? Movie, also TV shows. So I, I have to say, like, I haven't seen a lot of movies in the cinema, which is going to be disappointing to you, and I hope, I no, hope you don't uh, judge me for it. But I, I don't like people. I think people have ruined the cinema experience. I don't like to hear someone you – know, you get these people who go to this and they, they talk back to the screen. Okay. Those people must be murdered in their seats. Well, we, funny enough, have a night at the Bioscope called like a quote-along night where we encourage that. But then you know what you're coming for. But, but those I think, are like people who are super fans. Yeah, are going to say the line. And I think as that's, it happens. that's a place. To, that's a place. I'm to talking do about it. these people who are sitting there munching popcorn, talking shit. and slurping on some drink. And then as soon as the guy goes, "I love you," they go, "Oh my god!" And they make that kind of noise and they sure, clap sure. In, the, in the middle of the movie and just shut up. It's not about you. Your yeah. reactions are the least interesting thing. It's not the reason anyone came to see this movie. Sure. Shut up. Get out, <laughs> you, you juvenile. Um, perhaps you could appreciate this story then. I remember watching the movie Jerusalem. Do you remember that? The no, South African. I never saw it. It was a South African film that came out probably sure, over 10, 13 years ago. Okay. Uh, set in Joburg, cool crime story about Kingpin sort of coming to power. Mm. And I remember watching it. And hearing this dude talk behind me, and it was annoying. And and I was about to t- turn around and tell him to shush. But then I realized what he was doing, and he was actually like talking to his partner and explaining to her. She blind. No, <laughs> but just things that he was recognizing oh, that he was kind of seeing. What a stupid partner. What an irritating couple. No, Those are the kind of people um, who, while you're sitting at a dinner party, they, he's busy whispering to her and she's whispering to him the whole time and you go, oh, why did we invite these people? Well, I'm sorry. What I'm more trying to say <laughs> is, is, is more of a good story, which is, which is he, there was representation and he was like seeing himself. He was seeing his Oh, who world. cares? Shut up and watch it at home then. <laughs> What an asshole. Okay, well, oh. I, I look back on that and I thought, okay, no. well, this is, this is this, cool this that is he's why, able to see okay, his yeah, so, so world I, I, and I, his I story. Don't even know. In, Screw in him. He's busy making, he's talking behind you while you're trying to watch the movie. Uh, sure. No idea of other people. Okay. Totally no. self absorbed. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is not the kind of thing you do. This is what you do at home, which is what I do. And I don't even talk when I'm at home watching a movie, sure. I watch it. And I'll watch it on the, the, the TV or on, on the laptop, and I'll enjoy it. I love history. All right, So I, okay. wa- I watch lots of these uh, historical and biographical movies, which I love. I love, love, love. Those are my favorite movies of all time. Historical biographies. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I watched this great one, uh, 2015 movie just the other day. Um, Tom Hardy plays both Reggie and Ronnie Cray. It's called okay. Legend. Okay. Great movie about what happened in the 60s in London. These two brothers who were gangsters. 
and Tom Hardy plays both the twins. Oh, cool. I like Tom Hardy. He's so good. It was really good. That was worthwhile. Then you'll really like Oppenheimer. I probably will. I probably will. You know, maybe we can take the, the, the cinema experience out of it for you and you can wait a little until it comes. But ultimately, that's what it is. It's this historical biography. And it really is this incredible character study of a, of a, of an interesting person. He was he's quite a genius. He's a genius. So they, I think they do an and incredible. He's a communist. He's <laughs> still not sure. <laughs> little, little pink, yeah. but it certainly ruined the latter half of his life, those mm. ties, those yeah. communist ties. But, um, well, you know what they say. I mean, once you've, uh, you've associated yourself in any way with communists, they'll poison everything else about your life. Well, yeah, and at that time... Dreadful people, communists. Have you met them? <laughs> I've met them once. They're awful. Um, but the, you'd appreciate the way that Nolan, at least in the beginning half of the film, tries to get you inside his mind, this brilliant mind. And so it especially is nice with good IMAX sound. But as you see the way these atoms are flying through the air and you, and you, and you just try and get a sense of what's going on in his head, it's lovely. You're a real movie guy, though, huh? Well, I just you love appreciate this stuff. it. <laughs> no, you, I can tell you love this stuff. See, I'm I'm more of a casual kind of movie guy. No, it's not. I, I, I love a good that? story. Um, I love the way that movies have brought to life so many of the things that before you had to have in your imagination. Sure. I think we've lost something. That's why I also believe radio has got its its role because you tell one story. And a hundred thousand people see a different picture in their heads. They're imagining it, yeah. Same Which with is podcasting, special. yeah. Same with podcasts, same with books. Mm. But those are the only three places you still get that: podcasting, books, and 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 then reading. Mm. Um, I mean, I mean uh, the overlap with them, which is audiobooks. Yeah. Um, but I think if you're a real movie fan, then maybe the way you've just described these scenes, you analyze the stuff, and you, you know, you you're you're impressed by like beautiful cinematography and and a, and a scene that you you almost could use as a still photo that mm. turns into a moving photo and and that kind of thing I understand I have an appreciation for it but I'm it's kind of like my attitude to food I can I can appreciate a good meal but I have no interest in how it's made yeah so, I'm actually so funny enough a bit like that with, so, yeah with, so with the, food so then I follow the maxim that uh, someone once taught me which is Absolutely true, and it's wise. Uh, people who enjoy sausages would do well to stay out of the kitchen and see how they're made. Interesting. Right? Yeah. I feel the same about a movie. I'm not one of those people who's going to sit and deconstruct it. I used to hate them doing that to us at school. They would, they would take a really great movie, and by the time you'd done a breakdown of every scene and figured yeah. out the plot and where the – uh, denouement is and <laughs> sure. how, how no, they I, put together the composition of every every frame and the color and the lighting and I felt that it had almost removed the innards from the thing and sure. made it an analysis rather than something to be enjoyed. Yeah, I must say I do go into cinema very fun like that and very relaxed. I don't overanalyze and overcriticize and I I wouldn't even consider myself a cinephile. I've got lots of friends that are far more into into the weeds, okay. And I, I quite like just appreciating some simple, happy, fun story that's like a more made for TV movie. I can appreciate it all. Do you use the the the, the critics as a barometer? Do you use um, Rotten like, Tomatoes? Do you use any of that stuff too? It, it perhaps helps, especially when you think like you've got to make a decision whether the next two hours are, are going to be worth it. Um, but perhaps you'd appreciate. There's a guy called Leon Fanirop. I don't know. Whether I know who Leon you know Fanirop is. He used to. He was like the Afrikaans Barry Ronger for a long time. Yeah, right? and he yeah. and he is is doing that uh, with every day that goes by. And he he lectured us at Wits once, and he said, "If you come out of a film different to how you came in, it's done its job." Oh, that's clear. That's and good. it's such a lovely yeah. mm. measure, which is like, are you angrier? Are you more excited? Are you yeah. more motivated? Are you more horny? Like are you that. more frustrated the worst thing a film could ever do is just leave you cold where you kind of forget that you watched it like that's probably the best measure that i have walked out of movies before i'll never forget uh, ashton kutcher's dude where's my car <laughs> okay i should have known <laughs> maybe the name was and a there were two others there was one called dark city yes I what an that. absolute steaming pile of shit 
Um, I went to see that with my two best friends at Varsity. I walked out. Okay. My other mate walked out about halfway through, and the other one stayed for the whole thing. He thought it was amazing. <laughs> it was, oh, this is brilliant. This is genius. I Mis- remember it being Mr. a yeah. Chair and Mr. Desk and Mr. White and Mr. Orange. And I was like, what nonsense is this? You could just tell someone had been given, like someone's brother or cousin had given them a budget and said, go and make a movie. It was rubbish. <laughs> and what, what? dude, where's my car? I knew. Five minutes in, I was like, this is not going to happen. Yeah, I just got like, up. And I've got. Out. I've got. More. I didn't even. I didn't even excuse myself from the people I was there with. I was like, "There's no way I'm going to sit through this." <laughs> and I, I do have. A we bit did of it a, as a as a drinking game once. At really? The yeah. And we've what, got what, an, we've got a night called Cheesy Movie Night where these movies sometimes make an appearance. Oy, oy, oy. But we did it as a fun. Um, silly also night, hated yeah. that Stanley Kubrick. Um, Nicole Kidman, Tom Cruise. Oh, Eyes Wide Shut. Eyes Wide Shut. Mm. Hated that movie with that piano that kept going bling, bling, <laughs> bling, bling. See, that's just where I think they've gone beyond yeah. making an entertaining movie and, and it becomes so self-indulgent. You can just tell. It, like, what, okay. was, what were some of the others that you loved? I loved – I mean, I've just given you like history as a category, right? So yeah. I think that I've always loved um, Kingdom of Heaven – which I watched the director's cut of. Mm. That's about the the crusade and Saladin and you know the, the 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 actual kingdom of Jerusalem that was established in the 1100s. Um, because again, it has relationships to actual history. Mm. And while it's it's not true to history, it, it's a beautiful story, well told. Yeah. I don't mind a long. I mean, I, I loved the Alexander movie too. Oh, the um, with Colin. Farrell, we, Colin Farrell as Alexander. We, as I the love blondie. That. Yeah, I, I like um, – ah, there's so many of those that, that I, I still think are magnificently done. Um, there was a, a tremendous version of King Charles II played by – King Charles II? Yeah, I can't, I can't remember who it is now. Well, one, one thing that you might like is a film called The Lost King. What's that? It is a, it's about King Richard. And it's a it's a true story oh, of the woman. I'll tell you, let me just while you bring that up. Yeah, yeah. Greatest movie rediscovered by me, obviously for many people who understand movies and The Lion in the Winter with Catherine Hepburn. Okay, I don't know. It, it is it is probably just the dialogue in this thing is Catherine Hepburn. Catherine Hepburn. It's that old. Mm. It is beautiful. Everything about it, every line yeah. that What's the, the two principal story. So the principal characters, Catherine Hepburn plays um, the wife of King Henry II, Eleanor of Aquitaine, and the two of them Jesus, what, are together for a Christmas in the early 1100s with their four sons, who are all bickering and fighting over who's the favorite, who's going to inherit. And Henry II is John Gilgood, I think. We'll do a little fact check on I'll, this. I'll and check and it put quickly it in. now because if I'm wrong, it's going to be embarrassing. But no, but it's, um, we can always… Lion in the Winter. Let me look this up for you because it's absolutely bloody brilliant. The and Lion in the Winter. The Lion in the Winter, yeah. So set in Christmas 1183. I even got the dates roughly right. Centers on the political and personal turmoil in the royal family of King Henry II of England. And it, uh, we've got… Who have we got in this movie? Oh, she won the Academy Award for Best Actress in Leading Role that year. Okay. And I can see why, right? It is where, beautiful. Where were you when you watched it? I watched this on my laptop in bed one night just three or four years ago. <laughs> okay, and I, great. I, I mean, it's, it's not available on, yeah. you know. It's out in the seas. As it's we, out as we, there. Peter O'Toole. Peter O'Toole is Henry yeah, that's II. A, that's a famous. That's They've a famous got movie. Anthony Hopkins as, as King Richard. Okay. They've got um, Timothy Dalton. As the French King Philippe, it's so beautiful. Now, what I liked about it is that the the writing is so good that you can tell that they poured over every line. They thought, now is this powerful enough? How can we change this? How does the interplay between the characters, the results from this line, add value to the movie? By the end of it, you're you're just you're blown away, and it's the most beautiful love story. 
I wonder whether it's the same King Richard because I, I must I, say I, I don't, don't know. But no, it's but, it's not. But, but it, this movie there worth, was a, just watch this movie. Okay, you'll want to you'll want to put it on. Thank you. Uh, there is a King Richard who was largely misunderstood and largely discredited, and was buried. Um, in a place that nobody knows. Okay, you're talking about King Richard the Third. That's it's a king different Richard king. III. Okay, it's a little later on. He's in, a, in a, I think, the early 1400s. Uh, Battle of Bosworth was where he was hacked down by Henry Tudor. Yeah. And yes, he was buried under a car park in Leicester. So this movie called The Last King is about the woman who goes on this research campaign and finds a movie or documentary it's a, it's a movie it's a okay. fiction it, well it's a it's a narrative story it's yeah. got the woman who was in shape of water okay. you'll recognize her face um and she plays the woman who finds him in the parking lot i gotta watch this yeah it's that lovely and so she 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 sort of gets these visions of richard he sort of arrives he sort of sits on the bench outside her house and Amazing. He sort of sees her and she thinks she's going insane, but then he can't obviously answer her questions, but she just knows she's got to uncover the truth Wow! and goes on this quest. And it's a true story. No, that, about sounds, woman. that sounds amazing. Okay. No. Love it. Cool. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I am enjoying this. Go on. <laughs> Go on. Um, what, is, um, what is exciting you now with your your – Life and so we we're nine years in at Cliff Central. We you know podcasting is now established. I think it's kind of mission accomplished there. And although the business is really successful by anyone's standards, particularly in an economy like this, I feel like we could be doing more. And I'm looking at ways to kind of innovate again. Mm. A few years later, you have to keep changing. You have to keep advancing. Keep thinking ahead. Yeah, and. I'm ready to make some some moves and some changes, but I don't think that that means that this business is in any way threatened. I'll add those things to what we're already doing. Mm. Where do you where do you see things? I think the way things are going, it's increased disintermediation. I think you know there there aren't those big things that you were talking about earlier, those big events that pull people together anymore. Mm. People are ever more discerning. They're finding the content they care about. I yeah. hate that word content because, you know, it comes from when people are coding an app or they're filling a website up mm. um, in order to present it to people. And the stuff they just throw in yeah. to fill that is called content. Okay. And by virtue of the fact that you're looking at how the app works or how the website works, the content itself doesn't matter. Okay. So the term content in that respect spilled over into this hold-all term for any kind of entertainment yeah. um, or information. Yeah. And I feel like that word has just been horribly hackneyed and used in the most terrible ways. So now people are content creators. Yeah. I mean, what an awful thing to be called. It's not a sexy term. That's what everybody does, from brilliant musicians who write songs to people who sit in front of a mic and, and, and talk nonsense. Yeah, it sort of takes away what exactly it is that yeah. they're making. Yeah, I mean, musician is a real title. Um, even radio presenter is a real thing. Yeah, well, uh, someone could say I'm a I'm – a, Actor, I'm a whatever. I'm a political commentator. But to say you're a content creator almost hides the ball. You know, it's like, well – what are you producing porn for only fans yeah because those, those are content creators and i think that in some cases yeah. that is literally the answer and yeah. then they're trying to hide then, then what they're use really that up to. then use that term because i am a content creator you're like okay it so, could mean you know you, you watch some of the things people do on youtube for example there's one guy who he just he changes he like unboxes shit <laughs> Sure. He, he take he gets a box <laughs> with something he's ordered on eBay, and then he or on Amazon, and he yeah. opens it, and peep, millions of people, <laughs> these brain dead people, are watching this happen. Yeah, and he's got numbers through the roof, and I'm like, content creator. Yeah. Okay. Well, so what do you what do you um what would you want to be doing more of? Um, look, part of the reason that it's a struggle to get me to the cinema is because I've had this incredible experience in my 20s and 30s and, and now 40s of, of being in television and in radio and going to all these cool events and being a part of like a really exciting time in South Africa. 
I kind of like to be on my own a lot. I sure. also like to be around people I already know. I'm always happy to meet new people. It would be uh, a lie for me to say that I'm, I don't like meeting new people. But as I said to you about the experience of, of the universe that we, we went to see at, at Bioscope, once I'm there, I love it. Sure. But to get me to actually go and to say yes and to leave my house at the appointed time to go and do it, yeah. I feel like I'm, I'm becoming a, a bit of a hermit. Yeah, well, I used the term hermit lust at one point <laughs> as an antithesis to wanderlust. Yeah. Where I was like, and I think that can only come from someone who has had a very fulfilling Between you and me, I life thought week, COVID day. was a really stupid idea. But personally, I really didn't mind. I was Just okay with it know. too. Yeah. I, I actually thought I was, in fact, more of an introvert going into COVID. And then halfway through, I was like, no, no, I'm an extrovert. I do, yeah. I do need to well, talk to other look, people. So, and- so Monday to Friday, I'm happy to not see a whole lot of people. I get my, my, my uh, requisite amount of, of inspiration or connection with people at work. Mm. And there's a lot to do during the week. You're, you're, you're busy. Sure, and the um, same with the bioscope. I was meeting lots of people with short straw. There's lots of people around you. So I was, I was very stimulated. But I don't do things during the evenings at home in the week. <laughs> I sound yeah. like the most boring, crabby old bastard in the world. But it comes but after I, having done years and years of lots yeah, of things. Yeah, fr- and when people recognize you, and this is not like some, oh, it's horrible to be famous thing. But yeah. in this country, there aren't really famous people. Yeah, The most famous people in this country are people who are dead already. Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. That's it. <laughs> sure. No, really. Yeah. Nobody else is really that famous. Yeah, and, Morgan Freeman only comes out to… Uh, but he's not from here. To, no, but he only does that event where he reads passages for certain people. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, correct. He's not going to do that for me when I'm dead. Yeah. And the fact is also that I, I, I don't need a lot of uh, stimulation from, from other people. I get it from books, from movies occasionally, from, mm. from listening to podcasts, from music. Mm. All of those things are tremendously inspiring to me. So it almost feels like that small talk that you have – when you're at drinks parties or things, yeah, sure, not really my scene. And I, I mean, I've got very good friends too, who are mostly really exciting, smart people. Yeah, so and then I, they, I get then they can stimulation. stimulate you. Absolutely. And, yeah, you need that. You need. And that I love my family, so I see a lot of them. But from the point of view of the career, I would be happy to invent something and just make tons of money, and you never hear from me again. <laughs> I really would. Sure. I'm not looking for attention. Yeah, if that's what it is, and the media business in this country is only so big, yeah. so I'm in no way giving up on it. But there's not a lot of continents that left to explore in terms of media in sure. this country. Where, yeah. where, what, what, what is there to do? I'm not. I'm going to make a movie. Mm. Um, ironically, we're talking a lot about movies, but yeah. that's not something I want to do. And you don't want to write another book, by the sounds of it. No, <laughs> not now. <laughs> Maybe one day when I've really lived. Yeah. And I, I have a very good time. I'm, I'm very happy. I wake up in the morning and I'd rather be me than anybody else, which is a very, it's a very cool, yeah. And it's not by choice or by some uh, genius that I've discovered this. It's just that I am, my brain chemistry is such that I'm very happy to be me. I wake up, I go, hmm, it's good to be Gareth. I always go, could be better if I looked like, you know, a movie star, or if I had a billion dollars in the bank. But it's not so bad being no. I'm not jealous of anybody else. Yeah. And I think that the, the thing that keeps me interested is, and I've always been curious about the world, is I'll always discover something new and worthy of learning. And sometimes it's sitting talking to someone like you. Mm. Sometimes it's picking up a good book, listening to an audiobook, podcast. Um, Perhaps you'd, you'd want to do some kind of travel show? I do, I do a fair amount of travel. My favorite part of travel is coming home, which isn't to say that travel isn't fun. Yeah. But my favorite part of it is to come home having had the experience. Yeah. And give presents to people and talk about the thing when it comes yeah. up in a discussion like this. And yes, I've had extraordinary opportunities to, to travel. Um, there are lots of places I still want to go. Yeah. Where's, where's next on the bucket list? Sure. Um, you know, I've always been, because again of history, was wanted to go and see places like Iran, but not for Iran, for Persia, uh-huh. for Persepolis and Pasargadae. 
Okay, so when you speak of history, you, you're really going back. Yeah, well, it, it, there's also modern history. I mean, I did yeah. last in, in, I said last, this year in, in April, um, a friend of mine organized a trip for us to the, the battlefields of the Second Anglo Boer War. Yeah. Which you remember was, doing those as, as a kid I in do. high school. And I, I loved them then and I love them now. I don't think I appreciated them enough. Didn't you? As a kid. I, I would love to oh, go man. back as an adult. It's amazing when you go back to certain well, things as an you, adult and you can appreciate you know, when it When you're more. a kid, you want the instant gratification stuff. You want... Uh, you, no, you, I, I think I did appreciate it to some degree, but I, I don't know how much of it retained. I, I loved this, no, this trip in April. I loved. You're wandering around, they're explaining how the battle worked out where it was and where everybody was placed and who surrendered and the character of the, the general and you know mm. the, the political situation in the country and it, I find that stuff really really exciting because history as I've said so many times to people is the only subject you do at school that's about people the rest yeah. is about things or about language or about yeah no and you can just learn such an incredible amount about how the world's going to react to something yeah because human nature doesn't change yeah and humans are prone even with the best lessons that other people have learned for them to pay no attention to those lessons and go ahead and make the same mistake <laughs> themselves yeah. i think hopefully uh when covid 2022 or 23 arrives <laughs> someone will go like maybe we don't have to ban the park like, that was silly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully if COVID comes along next time, no one listens. Yeah. Because I, I think uh, having, you know, with retrospect looked at it, I don't think my life uh, changed at all. I didn't listen to any of those rules. I didn't bother with any of that stuff. I, I think the first weekend I spent quietly at home thinking, hmm, hope no one dies. Because we were all scared. Yeah, sure. And the second weekend I was like, this is a disaster. Mm. We have to get out of this. Because remember it was like, Two weeks to flatten the curve. Yeah. Or something, and sure. ended up being like three years of just stupidity. Sure. No, can't there's wear, a certain amount can't of Can't wear open notes. shoes, buy Woolworths chicken, uh, yeah. don't smoke, don't drink. Sure. Wear a mask. We know those are pointless. Everybody was, everybody who made those rules was stupid and they must still apologize to us. But paradoxically, it was a very good time for me. I yeah. enjoyed doing my own thing. Yeah, good. Lovely, man. Yeah. Let's not go there again, but, yeah. but I, I will come to the bioscope again. Thank you. And it'd be lovely to, oh. lovely to have you. Sure. Anytime. So Tell yeah. me what's going on. No, thanks, man. Good. Cool. Well, thank you for your time. Pleasure. I appreciate Absolutely. hanging out. No, it's very good. All right. What a chat. Yeah. <laughs> I think you know what you're getting when you, when you get Gareth Cliff in. <laughs> he is a... Uh, He's very outspoken. Yeah, definitely. Very strong opinions. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of it uh, could perhaps r rub some people the wrong way, but... Yeah, whenever you get people who are like forthright with their opinions, they're going to ruffle feathers. Yeah, they're I not mean, going to be everyone's friend. Yeah, exactly. But uh, I, I believe that for the most part, um, his, his intentions are, are in a good direction. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there might be perhaps some casualties uh, along the way, but... <laughs> But um, the, the, the intentions are good, and yeah. I think he's got South Africa's good in, in mind. Yes. And I think that's what he's shooting for a lot of the time. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was good, to, good to have that time with him. Definitely, yeah. I, I appreciated that. Mm. Um, it had me realize something. Yep. That this idea of like a household name. Yes. And, and what I think is so interesting now, and it's, as as the media landscape changes, mm. what feels like every day, it had me realize that only when we all tuned into mainstream media yeah. did we have these household names like Derek Watts, for example, yes. rest in peace. Yeah, you know, and Gareth Cliff. They were all part of a, as you said, this kind of national project. Mm. You know, he said it in the chat. I I think about this often with with Short Straw because when we were on radio, that that was a big deal. Yes. And that gave us this, this, this huge exposure. Yeah. Where now it feels like we're so segmented, mm. um, especially in a place like South Africa where we are so diverse. Yes. Um, as much as we do come together in, in, in some shapes or forms, for the most part, we, we listen to drastically different music. Yeah. Um, 
we consume drastically different TV shows. Um, nothing wrong with that no, necessarily, especially not. when it comes to the amount of languages we have. Yes, but I wonder whether the idea of a household name has gone is going to go. Yeah, and it's quite hard now because we're in that transitionary phase. Yes, because we still we still have the, the the we still remember those things. Yeah, and those people. But I, I said to someone, this is a bold statement, <laughs> but something like Game of Thrones. Yeah. That was like the la- one of the last TV shows we all tuned in for. Yeah. I wonder whether there will ever be a TV show that'll ever be the same. Yeah. Well, something, I mean, something Gareth actually said that I really agree with is the problem of content. Yeah. Everything has become content. It was, it was actually, I think Bill Gates was the first one to actually use the term in that way. Essentially, everything online is content. Yeah. Which is a, which is a problem because it means something like, for instance, I just watched a two hour long YouTube video where a guy spent a year of his life making a documentary about the castle of Cagliostro, which is... Um, <laughs> What's that? It's Hayao Miyazaki's first feature film. Okay. Um, he spent two, like a year of his life making this thing, right? Yeah. So, but it's on the internet, so it's content. So it has the same value as Elon Musk's last stupid tweet. Because yeah. a tweet is also content. Yeah. You know, they're all kind of judged in the same way. Yeah, and 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 yeah, there's a whole there's a whole sector of content yeah. that is just pretty women dancing. Yes. They're, and not, it's doing, all they're not doing anything else. They're, yes. not, they're not saving the puffins. Yeah. They, <laughs> they're not raising any money. Yes. They are literally just shaking their ass. Yeah. <laughs> no, and and yeah. And I get there's an audience for that, but the problem is it's la- it's the same thing as something that somebody's put time and care and effort into well speaking of time care and effort yeah uh, there's a netflix show that i just um started watching last night funny enough mm-hmm. called live to a hundred okay where the main guy and now i've forgotten his name but the main guy has dedicated the last 20 years of his life yeah to studying what's called the blue zones okay which is the parts of the world where People are living the longest. Right. And I think this is fascinating. Okay. I remember first hearing about this in a podcast where I think it was this island uh, or Sicily, parts of Sicily, oh, okay. this Italian island. Yes. Where people are studying these people for right. the first time because they're realizing all of them are living to 100 and well over 100. Right. And of course, it's, a, it's no single secret. Yes. But it, this, this limited series called Live to 100 mm. – is on Netflix where this guy is now going to finally break open and show his 20 years of research, which of yes. course has come along the way in 20 years. Yes. He's done a lot of talks, and but this could probably be the most formative explanation of what he's learned. Okay. And um, there's fascinating stuff. Right. One of the biggest takeaways, and I don't want to, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to diminish this guy's like, you know, decades of work, yeah. but it, it, it's balance of, uh, what you eat yes. and your society and how you guys interact. Generally speaking, it's like good, clean food. Right. It's, if you can imagine a, an, an Italian village. Yes. <laughs> you know, everyone just talks shit <laughs> in the center. Yeah. They all get together and wherever you go, even, <laughs> funny enough, yeah. even in Joburg, if you go to, there's a there's a restaurant in Louis Berta, like mm. a deli called Super Sconto. Right. Where they sell authentic Italian products. Right. Even there, yes, there's Italian men that just talk shit to each other for hours. <laughs> I remember going there for a sandwich, <laughs> and he like just spoke shit for hours to each other, <laughs> and and that is what is making these folks live long. Yes, um, because they've they they socially, mm. you know, they they're not they're not dying away by themselves. Right. They they're doing it together in the town square, and yes. even if you go. To, What's that other one in Norwood? It, it's a Joburg parking lot, but Oaks are still sitting out in the parking lot <laughs> talking to each other in Italian. Um, there's that. And then there's also the first episode is, is set in Japan. Okay. And um, the Japanese, in, in true Japanese style, yes. have got like a word for something. Right. You know, to embody an idea. Yes. <laughs> we don't have that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish we did. Um, but there's something called Ikigai, Ikigai which is basically... The name given to to your your purpose in life, your mission, your, right? You know what you bring to the world: yes. sewing, or farming, or you know, it's 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 yeah, your mission in right. life. And and all these people have that, and they don't ever mm. retire, right? There's no such idea as retiring okay. in Japan. Mm. 
you just you continue to work <laughs> in some shape or form. Yes. There's no idea of like I've got to go until a point and it's interesting. Right. Okay. But it's not about staying, you know, s- staying um alive for longer. It's yes. about enjoying your life. And right. then ironically you then it's not like these billionaires spending millions and millions of dollars to try and extend their lives and that sort of thing. It's about you know, yeah, the, the, why it, you stay alive. Yeah, it's a quality yeah. of... And the essence is, yes. is that. Speaking of staying alive yes. or dying, <laughs> a good whodunit that I'm enjoying oh, yeah. is Only Murders in the Building. Okay, it's on season three now. Season three. Okay, and I haven't watched any of it. I've heard it's very good. It's delightful. Cool. And it's it feels very classic and old-timey in a okay. sense. Because not only do you have uh, Steve Martin and Martin Short. Yeah, like a classic comedic duo. Yeah, yeah, which are two actors very much in their third act mm. of life. They have had these long and illustrious careers. Yeah. And then the third wheel in the in the combo or in the ensemble is Selena Gomez. Yeah. So she brings this very young okay. audience cool. to the show as well and a young energy to the show. Mm. And basically what it is, it's a good old whodunit. Cool. Um, in each season, someone's died, right? And the and the funny joke is that it's happened inside their building, which is this iconic building in, right. in New York. And they um, make a podcast about this. Okay. And so they've now become known as podcasters right. for for true crime. Cool. <laughs> um, but in the latest season, it's. Um, Meryl Streep comes out. And Paul Rudd's in it, isn't Paul he? Paul Rudd yeah. is great. He plays this like absolute sort of dickhead. Right. Um, he kind of plays like a like a nasty version of himself. Right, okay. This This big um, Hollywood superstar that's yes. been in stupid movies. Right. You know, like they kind of play at the idea of him being this Marvel superhero. Right. Okay, cool. Um, but um, Martin Short is, is just phenomenal. Mm. He's just great. Yeah. He's very funny, dude. And, um, and uh, yeah, and Meryl Streep is is Meryl Streep. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Have you ever seen that funny um, picture of that <laughs> that like Maltese poodle that's sitting on the chair that's got Meryl Streep's name on it? No, <laughs> it's so funny. Obviously, you know, when, you know that classic director's yeah set chair where yes. they write the person's name, and there's this Maltese poodle sitting there, and, and <laughs> the caption goes, "My God, she's talented." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is great. That's good. Um, what are you? What are you enjoying? Uh, well, Ahsoka just started the new ah, Star Wars series. Ahsoka, yes. And um, that who who's who is Ahsoka? That's um, she is not in any of the movies. Curiously, because she's a very important character in the grand scheme of things. Because she was Anakin's Padawan. Padawan, for those who don't know, yes. is the sort of apprentice. Yeah, of she a. Was, of a, a Jedi. Jedi. Yes. So she was Anakin's Padawan between episode two and episode three. Oh. Yes. Okay. So they sort of, when they made episode two and three, they obviously didn't consider yeah, her at this all. this character didn't exist. But they've yet. since filled in that gap. Yeah. And then she's been a part of some of the Star Wars TV shows. Mm, Clone Wars. Clone Wars. And Rebels. And I think from the outside, mm. being someone who has um, enjoyed Star Wars from the shallow end. Yeah. Casually. Casually. Um, I did notice that character when when some of the things came out. I obviously, mm. never watched any of that stuff, but yes. I noticed it because she's she's got this very um, distinct looking head. Yes, with like tubes. I don't know what the, what the name of her, her head, her, her, her species is. I don't know that. Yeah. Who's the actress that's playing her? Um, in the show, it's Rosario Dawson. I like her. Yeah, she's great. She's she was great. actually she was like sort of a fan cast in a way. Like a lot of people who are fans of the character, like if they ever do live action, they should get Rosario Dawson. And they went, okay. Interesting. We'll, we'll do Rosario Dawson. She's a good choice for that character. Okay. But what's, I think what's interesting is when they first introduced her in Clone Wars, people did not like her. They oh. Like she's a precocious, unlikable little like tween. Oh, really? They were like, oh, we don't like this. So they kind of, instead of doing what, these days they would just go, oh, we're just never going to put that character in anything ever again. But okay. instead they kept kind of like working on it and evolving the character. And now she's like one of the, the like fan favorite oh, interesting. characters, yeah. People love Ahsoka. And and what was the what was the episode like for you? It's pretty good. Um, okay. I'm someone who, in terms of Star Wars, is kind of sick of just seeing the same thing all the time. Okay, like the same characters and the same planets and the same stories. It's always Jedi's and Sith, and there's guys with the letter T's for a face and big triangle spaceships. And I'm just like, I don't need this anymore. Okay, you know. 
you, you've of, had your you've had your I'm like Star Wars but, is so like it's like a whole fucking universe you can tell any story you want okay. but they kind of just keep telling the same kind of stories over and over again and because so they're safe of, and because they're money grabs exactly because okay. anytime they stray from that there's like a subset of fans who will just start screaming I'm sure you know but, um, <laughs> did you watch Andor yes because I think for the people who don't obsess over Star Wars yeah that was very celebrated because mm. it's a little bit like the Dark Knight. Funny enough, kind of. It was, it was in the the world of this kind of superhero mm. thing, but at the heart of it was something like a really good, well thought out thriller yeah. that just happened to have Batman in the background. Yeah, exactly. And and it sounds like Andor was a really well thought out. It's much more thriller, low almost. key, much more very political. Okay, like they kind of get into the trenches of the. The empire bureaucracy and how shit that all is. Okay, so which it was I really just enjoyed. smarter and, mm, and very well written. I think that's like a well key written. to it. Like they sort of tried to do. There's an episode in the third season of The Mandalorian where you can tell they're going, oh, like that stuff worked in this. Let's try and do our own version of that just in one episode, and it doesn't work because the writing's not as good. Uh, interesting. Yeah, and like yeah, Andor's a very good show. But like even for people who don't like Star Wars, Andor's the, Andor's the kind of thing that you can recommend because it's so kind of un Star Wars like. Mm. That's okay, good. and how's your uh, movie a day going? Yeah, it's going pretty well. I'm in a space phase. Okay, just watching so, a bunch of space movies. So for those who are unfamiliar, um, there's a there's a very good reason why Graham is <laughs> working at the video store. <laughs> Apart from being a very good friend and someone we always go and watch movies with, um, you have embarked on a very ambitious. Um, challenge for yourself yes to watch one movie a day yes every day this year yesterday was day 246 246 and i want you to apollo 13 oh lovely yeah it's a great movie i love apollo 13 yeah. it's such a good movie ron howard is a real like hit or miss director where's he missed oh, like those stupid angels and demons movies but they were solid i mean maybe they were they okay <laughs> all right and he did that movie that was like the the movie that was the true story that inspired Moby Dick, which is also really bad. But then every now and then he gets something like Apollo 13, which is amazing. The heart of the heart of the sea, something like that. With it wasn't Chris, bad. Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, it was. Um, a and Frost Nixon, which is fantastic. I think Frost okay. Nixon is a great movie. Um, but yeah, I really like Apollo 13. But Apollo 13 is great. Yeah. Yeah, I think it 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 kicked off. I decided to read um, Andy Weir's other books. So Andy Weir is the guy who wrote The Martian. Yes. Which is a fantastic book and a great movie. Yes. No, The Martian. The, was The Martian his first yes. book? How did he write it again? There was something kind of quirky and different about how The so, Martian came together. As far as I know, I haven't super looked into this, but I think what he was doing was a lot of the book is written in the form of like written logs written by Mark Watney, who's the astronaut who's stuck on Mars. Okay. So a lot, most of the book actually is in the form of like his written logs. Yes. Saying like, this is what happened to me today, but, 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 but so these the are the books, problems the, they had to solve. Did the book start with like, almost like blogs? Yeah. I think it essentially started as he was publishing it as, as if this was the actual blog, so to speak, of an astronaut trapped on Mars. Well, that's cool. And then when that kind of got popular and picked up a bit, they then turned that into a book where he went and wrote like the in-between chapters which are like more traditionally It was like written. sort of fan-funded, wasn't it? Oh, I actually don't know. I don't know. I heard something yeah. about that. Yeah, they, they, and I think the research was incredible. Mm, yes, like it's all, as far as I know, like the the math and the science kind of is is accurate yeah. as much as it can be. Okay, so if you remember the Martian that was Matt Damon, yes. where he gets stuck on Mars and yeah. it's all about the mission to bring him home. Ridley Scott directed. At one point, yeah, at one point he figures out how because he was a he was a botanist. He's a botanist, yes. Yeah, so he was he figured out effectively how to grow plants on mm. the space station so that he could survive. Yes. And um and apparently they were accurate that if you had to choose one plant or one thing mm. that could actually keep you alive, potatoes are the one. Okay. There's apparently a scientific fact to that. Cool. And that's maybe what he what he used. Mm. You know, if you eat anything else over and again, eventually it'll kill you. But yes. but if there was one thing that you could survive on, yeah, it would be potatoes. It would be potatoes. Okay, I think you've got the whole continent of Russia to back yes. that up. <laughs> you can make an island. Can, yeah, you can make um, vodka out of it. Yeah. And all that shit. Uh, cool. So that's what I've been enjoying. Yeah, from and then my side. 
he he's written two other books since then. Oh, one cool. is called Artemis, okay, which is sort of about like a colony on the moon. So the first like the first like habited colony on the moon, okay. and kind of like it's a few years old now, and there's like smuggling and crime and all the stuff going on up oh, there. Cool. So it's about a, a woman who, uh, uh, a young woman who's like smuggling stuff onto the moon and kind of gets involved in organized crime that's a little above her, you know. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It's good. It's not as good as The Martian, but it's, and again, like the, the science and all that stuff is is pretty sound. Yeah, it, it sounds like what he's very good at is not going into a galaxy far, yes. far away. It's like how how accurate... Mm. Um, the future would be yes, with actual science and yeah. actually what's possible. Yeah, exactly. Um, did you ever watch Ad Astra that Brad Pitt did? On? It's on my list to watch again recently because it's interesting how they at that point in the movie they'd well at that point in in society there was a pretty established moon station. Yes, and it looked like a subway station. There was a subway. <laughs> yes, and there was like yeah. a few shops, but that was the moon. Yes, yeah. I need to watch it again. I didn't enjoy it the first time I watched it. All the reviews I've read are like, this is amazing. And I just, I was found it a bit dull. So I want to watch it again and kind of reassess. Yeah. I think it was one of those movies that didn't present you with a plot. Yeah. Where they were like, here is the movie. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hold your hand and we're going to walk down this plot together. Yeah. It was a bit more like, here you are. It's, like, have a look around. It's basically <laughs> like, Brad. Figure it out for yourself. It's basically Brad Pitt going into space to find his dad, who's basically Colonel Kurtz. Which is yeah, a, that's I mean, right. It was a bit, was a bit apocalypse now. Yeah, it's like apocalypse. I didn't space. think about that. You know, which is again, mm. it's like such a cool idea, and like mm. I like the ideas, and it looks lovely, and mm. you know, quite slow, quite. Mm. Th- which is normally the kind brooding. of movie that I that I like, like character centric. Like maybe you weren't in the right place. Exactly. Though. That's why I do want to watch it again. Okay. And then I read Andy Weir, so I kind of read them backwards because they're not they're not connected. But I read a- Andy Weir's third book, which is called Project Hail Mary. Project Hill Mary. I fucking loved. Now these this. are going to become movies, eh? Yes, they've already. Both of these other ones have already been optioned by Lord Miller, so um, Phil Lord and Christopher Miller. Oh, that's a who the guys who recognizable did recognizable name. Yeah, they did like Twenty One Jump Street. They did the Lego Movie. They're very involved in the Spider Verse movies, uh, so they've been optioned. And it seems like they're kind of pushing Project Hail Mary first, even though it's his third book. They're kind of pushing that one ahead. Foster. Okay, what is that about? Because it's, man, I don't want to give away too much. Because I knew okay. nothing about it going in. So I loved, like, discovering everything that goes, that happens. So it opens with this guy who wakes up. He has no idea where he is. He's in, like, a, he's hooked up to all these, like, tubes and, like, all this stuff that's, like, feeding him and, like, bloodlines and stuff. Hmm. And there's two other people there who are also hooked up. They're both dead. Okay. And he has no idea where he is. He has no idea who he is. He can't remember his name or anything. But he kind of, when he gets like out of the sort of thing and he's trying to figure shit out, he quickly realizes, he quickly realizes he's, he's like sort of naturally quickly doing like calculations and all the stuff. He's like, okay, something, I know something about math and stuff. Mm. And he quickly realizes there's too much gravity. Okay. There's like 50% more gravity going on. Okay. So he's I don't want to say in, he's obviously in space of he's, some sort. Yeah, he's somewhere. Okay. Some, and that's all I want to say, because again, I didn't even read like the back of the book. Because, mm. like, even when I read that after I'd read the book, it's like, oh, that told me stuff I, I like, really enjoyed discovering in the book. Oh, cool. Nice so I think just go in, go in okay. blind. Okay. Ryan Gosling is attached to be in the movie. Mm. Yeah. Speaking of, yeah, Ryan Gosling being attached to space movies, yes. did you watch First Man? I, well, I watched First Man the day before yesterday. Oh, okay, that was, in your, that was in your space, yes. your space mission. It is fantastic, dude. Interesting. I Spa- love that. Yeah, it, it, that perhaps... I, a little bit like you watching Ad Astra. Mm. When I watched First Man, I also found found it a little weird and boring. Yeah. So the thing is, like, Apollo 13 is very, like, romanticized. It's very much about, like, the triumph of space and, like, the amazing thing that they did. Whereas First Man is this, like, very, like, singular character-focused thing. Yeah. And it's not even really about Neil Armstrong going to the moon. Mm. Yeah. It's, for, yeah. Uh, so First Man is Brian Gosling being Neil Armstrong yes. and it's talking about... It's, it's it's somewhat of a biopic about mm. Neil Armstrong. Yes, first first bloke on the moon. Mm. But it's not even really about that. It's what it's really centered about is how he is unable to process the grief of his daughter dying because his daughter, uh. he had a young daughter who was like 2 years old, she died of a brain tumor. And the whole film was like really centered about how he just like can't deal with this grief and the effect that that has on his family and on his work and oh, it's so good, dude. Yeah, I, I think that needs film. a rewatch for mm, me because because that was a bit lost on me. Mm. Okay, he's a fantastic Ryan Gosling is 
like the best actor of this generation, dude. I agree. He's incredible. I agree. So good. Mm. No, and he was phenomenal in Barbie. Yeah, and like completely like 180 in terms of like the sort of character. Like yeah. you look at Neil Armstrong and you look at Ken. Yeah. Like like couldn't be more different and he's so good at both of them. One of the lovely sort of bucket list or sort of highlight moments of my life was um, on an American holiday. We went to the Houston Space Center. Oh, uh, cool. And we did the tour where you can go into the control room. Right. And you can and you can see the control room that that coordinated the moon landing. Cool. And um, we sat in all the seats that all the dignitaries sat in, which uh, okay. was this booth behind this the center. Yes. Behind the actual control room. Mm. And he even the, the tour guide even pointed to one of the people in the tour group and said, yes. ma'am, were you sitting? That's where the queen sat. Right. Because <laughs> there were a whole bunch of famous, you know, um, politicians yes. and dignitaries that were there to witness it. Mm. Um, I thought that was cool. And then he points to the, the one speaker box, which we can see on the one desk of yes. the space station. He said, that speaker box said, one small step for right. man, one giant leap for mankind. It's cool. Yeah. And you actually go into these rooms at, and you can see some of the space rockets. Wow, dude. And those just, things, those just ones. to see how huge they were. I was about to say those ones that actually went to the moon. Those things were massive. Dude. Yeah. No, then, then they're, they're obviously lying sideways mm. in these big warehouses. The Saturn V. Yeah. yeah. Massive thing, dude. It's insane. Yeah. I can't yeah, remember how, how big it is, but it's multiple stories. Like yeah, yeah. Double no, digit like stories. A, yeah. You'd need three or four people just to be the circumference of um or just to be the what is it called from a one side to the other side of a circle mm. not the circumference the radius oh, diameter the diameter mm. three three or four people yeah. for 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 the actual rocket part the, uh, the blaster at the bottom yeah wild wild and then the bit that went to the moon was like a tiny tiny, little, a tiny like little it was room, the size yeah. of like two phone booths or something yeah it's wild yeah i saw that in the smithsonian Insane, dude. Yeah. Wild. Um, one other thing which I think is kind of cool to mention. Yes. Is that Welcome to Wrexham. Oh, yeah? The next season is going to be on Disney Plus soon. Cool. 12th of September it comes out. Cool. And, of course, we kind of know what happened in real life because it's a docu-series. Mm. So we know some things that have happened. Oh, okay. But, but a little bit like Drive to Survive, sometimes it's quite nice to just watch the TV show that yes. tells you the whole story yes. of what happened. Um, but for those who've missed it, Welcome to Wrexham is the docuseries of uh, Rob McElhenney and um, Ryan Reynolds mm. who have bought a Welsh soccer team mm. called Wrexham. Cool. And their investment has re-energized this town and the docuseries shows all the blows, all the things, all the advancements, yes. all the town characters and they follow a few people – and um, it's a great, it's the it's the real life Ted Lasso. Cool. It's probably the <laughs> quickest and easiest way to do it. Yes. Um, and it's a very smart investment. Mm. Funny enough, yeah. because if you, if it has, if something like a sports team has potential, yes. If you have millions and millions of dollars, yeah. which a guy like Ryan Reynolds has, yeah. Um, you can buy a team mm. at a relatively low rate. You can then give it huge exposure. You can yeah. buy other teams and they can go up the ranks, especially with something like in the UK, there's three or four tiers. Yes. And you can eventually sell this thing for billions. Yeah. Even like, for like, like the amount of merchandise you can make off of that. Yeah. It's no, insane. totally. So it's not a stupid investment no. if, if you can turn the team around. Mm. Um, and if that team, because that team's got potential to make it all the way up, they could yeah. be the next. Arsenal and Chelsea and yeah. Man United in however many years' time. Yeah. So and then you then you sell that thing for billions. Yeah, exactly. So it's super smart. Yeah. As an idea. Yeah. Anyways. But well speaking sort of like something that just costs a lot of money and ends up making you a huge amount of money. We saw Ninja Turtles a little while ago. Yes. It didn't do well at the box office. So it's only made like around $150 million. Okay. Which isn't very good. But apparently, so far this year, they've done like more than a billion dollars in toy sales. Interesting. Which is like, okay, you, you kind of understand now. It's like, oh, this is just like an ad 
for toys, uh-huh. which is what cartoons always used to be like. Saturday morning cartoons, Transformers and GI Joe and all that stuff. They just made them as adverts to sell toys. Yeah, it's a good point. You know, it's the exact same thing. So, like, despite the fact that this movie hasn't made, hasn't done very well, they're yeah. probably going to make more of them because they've made a fuckload of money. Yeah, you know, tangentially connected to it. Interesting. And then the, uh, uh, they'll also do very well when it's on when it's available at home. Yeah. Especially with kids. Like yeah. it is it's cool to take your kids out. Yeah. But when it's when you can just put it on T V Yeah, these days I think you with animated films in particular, I don't think they're making huge amounts of money because parents are just going, I'm waiting for it on Disney Plus. Yeah. Totally. You know? So the strike in Hollywood strikes, multiple strikes, the WGA yeah. and SAG are both still on strike. Yeah. So that's the writers the organization writers guild. and then the and then the actors guild yes. got on board as well. Okay. They're still on strike. We spoke about it a few weeks ago. You can look up details. But They've actually kind of done the math on what it is they're actually asking for. Okay. So between them, because the Directors Guild almost went on strike as well, but they managed to kind of sort that out before it kind of got bad. Not that it matters because no one can make projects now anyway. Yeah. Um, but they, they worked out basically what they're asking for is in the region of 450 to $600 million a year in total for both of these groups. 400 to $600 million. Yes. Which okay. is like, in Hollywood studio term, fucking nothing. It is nothing. Okay. It is like less than 1% of what these studios are making a year. Disney uh, alone is bringing in almost $90 billion a year. And these guys are saying, oh, no, we can't afford to pay these writers. Uh, interesting. It's such bullshit, dude. <laughs> interesting. It's wild, dude. Zaslav and, and Iger and these guys are just... And it's... They can't seem to like comprehend the fact that people aren't on their side with this. Like everyone is on the side of of like the guilds. Yeah, and a few a few of the smaller studios mm. who have the most to lose yes. or have the smallest budgets, they are the ones that are quite adaptable and they yeah. are um they've already agreed to some of these terms. Yeah, exactly. That's why they're they're allowed to um, market this new um Michael Mann film, Ferrari, with Adam Driver. Because the studio, I think the studio is called Neon. Yeah, Neon have agreed to the yep. terms. And so, so is A24. A24 is still working. And it's like these huge studios could, with, without even like trying, pay these people what they actually deserve. And it's weird to me that they're saying like, oh no, we can't afford this. But this is like, this will like ruin us. What you're saying is if you can't afford to pay people a living wage for, what they, for, for their work, your business is failing. That's what you're saying. Yeah. But they aren't. They're making hundreds of millions. Well, at least they're pointing out that that some part of the foundation of their business is is ridiculous. Yeah. As you said, if you can't pay minimum wage. But they can. That's the thing. They can easily afford to do this. They just don't want to because it takes like a little bit of profit away from them. Wild. It is insane, dude. Like, I mean, again, Disney alone made $87 billion over the last year. Mm. It is insane. Yeah, and they're saying they can't afford four hundred million. That's like collectively for all of the studios. That's oh. not just Disney. That is total of what like the the writers and the the screen the actors are, are asking for is in the region of like four hundred to six hundred million dollars a year. Okay, so that's basically almost like maybe one hundred each. Yeah, because there's about four six major platforms and yeah, streaming services. Exactly. Wild, it's wild. Just fuck these executives. <laughs> cool, man. I. It's nice to catch up. Yeah. It's nice. And I'm glad that you're feeling a bit better. Yeah. <laughs> you're a bit sicky. I was, um, you can hear I'm a bit groggy still. Yeah. You think you had the COVID? I think I had COVID. I realized that because I went to like the doctor and stuff on Tuesday. He's like, yeah, I have this stuff. Like have some, it's, it's a virus. You just get over it in like a yeah. week or whatever. Then on Thursday, I was making food and I was like, oh, I can't smell this. Uh-oh. And I was like, oh, I can't taste this. Little little flashback to, uh, <sighs> to 2021, yeah. 2020. Yep. Uh, but it's fine. Good to have you back. <laughs> um, okay, so for all of those who enjoyed today's episode um, with a radio personality, it's worth mentioning that in our plethora of back catalogue, yeah. there are other episodes with radio personalities. Cool. So heading backwards in order, we have uh, Stephanie B from 5 FM. Cool. She's episode 53. Then... As early as episode 11, Wild. we have Kerry Ann from Mix FM. Yes. Which, as I said at the start of the episode, I was very much bringing in all my friends yes. and personalities. Um, and I think some of those people should come back because yeah, definitely. when these episodes came out, we, we had a small audience. Mm. 
and that's since grown then. And we've kind of re- we've refined the whole show a lot. It's much yeah. More... So it'd be cool to give them the questions. Yeah, yeah. I think um, so. Okay, so that was Carrie Ann. She was uh, episode eleven, and mm. then as early as episode eight mm. was Nick Hammond from Five of Him. Cool. You should definitely come back. Yeah, I agree. All right. Uh, we are the video store. Thank you for listening. Our home base is the video store.co.za. And over there, you can find the links to everything. And um, yeah, once again, last reminder about those tickets. Oh, yes, for the Nun 2. For the Nun 2. Uh, a nice little horror. Mm, if you're into <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, we've got tickets to give away uh, for those just need a reminder. And the screening is going to take place on Thursday, the 7th of September in Joburg and Cape Town. Cool. And we've got a handful of tickets to give away. We want you to let us know on Instagram or on Facebook why you deserve them. Yeah. So that'll be in the comments of this week's episode. Cool. So in the post that we do on Instagram, we want you to leave a comment. Sweet. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks for listening. And we will see you again next week. Bye-bye. Cheers.